Welcome to the first hour of Patriots Levet. We're uh, working on stuff here. Steve uh, Steve Floyd's out of the studio today, and Matt Watts in here running the board for us, obviously. Blame me. Um, okay, we have a special guest today, and uh, he's the his website is chaosstand.com. He's the editor of the Early Warning Report, which if you're not a subscriber, you should be. And more affectionately to most of us in here, he's the writer and author of the Uncle Eric series, which we, of course, love. Um, he's great. We love him. Mr. Richard Mayberry is our guest. Richard, are you there? I am. All right, great. Thank you for coming back on the show. We appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. I enjoy it. All right. Um, last time you were on, besides the airplane that ran into a telephone pole and knocked us off the air, <laughs> we uh, were right in the middle of the election cycle. And we were talking about, obviously, the Republicans rejected Ron Paul for their for their man and picked uh, Barack Obama's twin brother, Mitt Romney. And we were discussing the what would what it would look like whether either one of them won. And you had thought maybe if Romney had won, I mean, it was all speculation, mm-hmm. but if Romney had won, maybe that. Uh, People would kind of let go of the purse strings a little bit. Business might start investing. And on the opposite end, if Barack Obama won, we thought we had the same opinion that people would kind of knuckle down and hoard their money a little more, or whatever. What? Obviously, Barack Obama won. What is your? What is? What are you seeing now? What do you think? Well, I, exactly what you were describing. I, I think people are scared. Um, and, and most importantly. The people who have the money and create the jobs are scared. And um, as you say, um, they're all just um, tightening down, um, standing to the side, waiting to see what's going to happen. I shouldn't say all. Um, there are people who are investing and are, are continuing to move forward. But, but basically, um, uh, as, a, as a sort of a general statement, anybody who's not crazy is scared. And um, they know full well that the federal government has spent 80 years getting itself into unimaginable financial trouble, and it's going to do whatever the honchos think is necessary to save the federal government. And that means stealing as much as they can from you and me. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, as, again, the people who create the jobs know this, and they know there's a lot more tax coming at them, and um, so they are tightening down and and uh, being very conservative in in their uh, business expansion plans. So the whole general tenor of things is is to spiral downwards, um, waiting for catastrophe. The uh, I just saw I think it was yesterday they were talking about. I say they, Congress, talking about one and a half trillion dollars in new taxes coming up. That definitely, <laughs> that definitely isn't the uh, something that people want to hear, especially in a economy that we have. I mean, I know they're telling us that everything's great, but all you have to do is actually be alive and know that it's not true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, did you see the article in the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago by uh, Chris Cox and Bill Archer? about the true uh, state of the federal government's finances? No. It was very good. They pointed out that the federal government's accounting is um, fraudulent um, and uh, probably has been for at least uh, a whole century, and that uh, nobody in Washington that they know of is actually working with a true set of books, a a book that a business would be required by law to uh, use. And so and, uh, they don't know how big the problem is. Um, and what Archer and, and Cox put together was a brief picture of it. You know, here's what the statistics show the government's financial condition really is. And, and I, I could very quickly for our audience uh, summarize it, I believe. Um, <clears throat> if the federal government were to confiscate all of the income of all corporations and all of the income of people who make more than $66,000 a year, 
they would still come up short about one and a half trillion dollars per year. So, yeah, I mean, the situation is hopeless. There, there's just simply no way that the federal government is going to be able to save itself. And uh, so that you know, leads to the question of, well, what's going to happen? And yeah, what, what, I mean, the only thing they can do is print more money, obviously, because they can't, I guess they could, but they can't just come take every dime that we produce in a year. I'm sure they would love to, but isn't their only option really to print money and no one wants to buy our debt so they got to buy it back from themselves what well you know any any 10 year old kid who's good at arithmetic arithmetic can tell them what to do that knowing what you ought to do is not difficult here <laughs> you got to quit spending so much money right <laughs> I mean, maybe i don't have much hope in that exactly yeah exactly because the way the way democratic governments operate, actually the way most governments operate today, is that they they buy votes. Um, you know, um, if you vote for me, then I'll give you what you want, and I'll make somebody else pay for it. That's what politics is all about. And um, they they can't keep this system going if they lose the ability to buy those votes. If they can't spend money anymore, then um, they can't buy your vote. So it's locked into the system. Um, I, I can't see a way out here uh, that's, that's going to be pleasant. Um, we're in for some really tough times. Uh, yeah, have, um, have you seen my most recent newsletter, uh, the December issue? I don't know if I got December's yet. I got, uh, I know I got November's. No, it was, it was not, I haven't gotten December's yet. Okay. Uh, one of the things I point out in there is that Americans are not taught that um, governments aren't permanent. Um, we have this this belief that we all get in school that the federal government is this thing that that has been here since uh, 1789 and it always will be. Um, <clears throat> the fact is that this is actually uh, the fifth republic that America is on right now. And um, I, I, you know, go down through that and show there was the um, the political system that existed before the American Revolution, and then there was the one during the American Revolution, and then there was um, there was one or two others in there, and then you come to the federal government today, which has existed since the Civil War, the, the federal government during the Civil War actually became a different government, and Mar Americans aren't taught that. Uh, the thing came out of the Civil War <laughs> ten times as big as it went into the Civil War. Mm. So it was a whole different government there. So we're on the fifth American Republic right now, and in my opinion, the thing's going to go belly up, and it will be replaced by a sixth republic, and then there will be a seventh and an eighth and so on. Um, and you know, the problem is the transition period. Getting from the Fifth Republic to the Sixth Republic is going to be a really unhappy experience for a lot of people, I think. Yeah, because the reason that it's going to, I mean, basically what you're saying is monetarily they'll be done. Mm -hmm. And that's going to hurt. Obviously, we have more people on welfare now than ever before. In our area right here in Fairbanks, 70% of the people work directly for a state agency and uh yeah that's going to be hard it's going to be hard not to well get your check in the mail every week or every month or whatever or if you don't have a job no one's going to go to work for not getting paid at least i don't mm -hmm. yeah um i i really don't worry too much about the the, <clears throat> the monetary transition because the world is already moving in what i regard as the correct direction there which is they're getting more and more skeptical about paper money because they know that paper money can be created out of thin air, and um, they really don't want it. And they're looking, you know, most of the world is looking for something they trust more than paper money. And um, there is a, a a push in the direction of using various commodities as money, which is, in my opinion, the way it ought to be. And and I think markets will actually solve the monetary problem without too much difficulty. But um, 
the political side of this thing is going to be nasty, I think. Now, I should point out, I'm not saying that the uh, state and local governments are going to go out of business. In fact, I would think the state governments will probably grow some from this because what will happen is that the federal government, in order to save itself, is simply going to start um, shedding huge amounts of the stuff that it does and and eventually, um, at least during the transition period, all of its assets and liabilities will be turned over to the states and, to a lesser extent, the counties and cities. And those local governments and state governments are going to have to um, decide what to do about the assets and liabilities that they are given. And now I don't know how long that period is likely to last, uh, you know, six months, a year, maybe five years, I don't know. Um, but you can already see the federal government shedding parts of its empire. Um, I was talking to a county sheriff uh, a couple of days ago, and he was telling me that it's very common throughout the American West for sheriffs to absolutely hate the federal government. And one reason is that the uh, the Bureau of Land Management, which owns hundreds of thousands of acres of land in the West, uh, is simply turning its land back over to the county sheriffs and saying, we can't patrol this anymore, we can't control it, um, we simply don't have the money to do anything with it, so it's yours. And, and so these sheriffs are finding themselves in the position where suddenly um, they're being handed hundreds of thousands of acres of land that they have to take care of. And, of course, the government isn't giving them any money to do it because it's broke. And so, so they're just enraged. And I think that that's a picture of what's coming all over the country. The, the government is just going to start shedding parts of its empire in order to try to save itself financially. Well, I, I kind of want to get back to the to more economic uh, another uh, you know back to what Josh was saying earlier about the 1.3 trillion dollars in potential new taxes. Mm -hmm. w what do you see as the specific effects of taking that 1.3 trillion dollars out of circulation by giving it over to in, in the form of taxes? So. Are there industries you see are going to suffer greater, or is this just going to be an across-the-board $1.3 trillion less in, hmm. in circulation in the United States? Well, there you're asking me to predict the behavior of politicians. <laughs> um, and I, well, I'm speculate. Not able to do Speculate's that. a better word. Kind of more <laughs> yeah, of a roll of the dice. Um, you know, as for, for what's going to continue being funded and what's going to be cut off, that's going to depend entirely on the political connections. No, 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 that that wasn't my question. My question is if you pull 1.3 like right now this 1.3 trillion is in people's pockets being spent. Mm -hmm. If you pull that out mm -hmm. of circulation by by turning it over in taxes, mm -hmm. what is the effect of the private what do you think that will be the effect of the private sector because of that reduction? Oh, um you make a good point. What an awful lot of people don't realize is that the the all economic entities compete with all other economic entities and the private companies compete with the federal government for the consumer's dollar if the government takes a dollar from you then that's a dollar you can't spend on a mcdonald's hamburger or whatever else and so yeah if they pull an additional 1.3 trillion out of the economy then they're going to reduce spending someplace um, in the private sector by $1.3 trillion. And so a whole lot of businesses are going to be going belly up or at least getting into a very deep financial trouble. And that's why you hear this this prediction that if there isn't some good solution to the so-called fiscal cliff, that there's going to be another recession. Well, yeah, for sure there is. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> again, I, this situation is hopeless. And, and that's, a, to me, the big challenge in all this thing is convincing people that the government has gotten itself into a situation it can't get out of. Well, what do you think is going to be the um, 
the burden, the debt burden that we have, what is what is the effect going to be on Americans when the government basically, when the feds go belly up? What is, what is going to happen to the debt? Well, you for sure don't want to own any kind of government treasury bills or bonds or any kind of government paper, um, its uh, its resale value in the open market will plunge, and um, you know, nobody's going to want it because they're not going to believe that the government can really uh, pay off on those things. So at that time, be out of all government paper. Um, now, I think there's going to be a period here where actually government bonds... Um, and bills and notes will actually increase in value because the Federal Reserve has announced that they plan to uh, do that. And they also have announced that they plan to drive up stock prices. So there's going to be a boom in the financial industry if the Federal Reserve has its way. Um, so you, you know, between now and the big catastrophe, we may actually get a big boom in stocks and bonds and other sorts of uh, investment paper. And, um, you know, you're going to be making a lot of profit there if you're in those things. But but do not consider them to be long-term investments. Those are speculations now for sure. And in my opinion, um, when when the government finally has its back to the wall and it cannot save itself, then you will see the, the Treasury notes, bills, and bonds uh, become either worthless or pretty close to it. That's just so exciting. <laughs> so, I we've uh, I mean, you can see, like you said, a ten year old can get this, figure this thing out. It's so obvious. You can't spend more than you take in, and we have been for years. I mean, every year now it's over a trillion dollars a year that we're spending more than we take in. You can't tax us into oblivion because then our private markets or private sector will just fail completely. Mm-hmm. So, Joe Blow, the guys in the studio, Richard Mayberry, our neighbors, what what do we do to protect ourselves? And we, we speculate a lot about this and that, and we like to talk about all these great scenarios that probably will never happen. So, what does the average guy do to prepare himself? I mean, obviously, there's ways that you can actually, like you just said, there, there will obviously be ways to make money off of it but ultimately when your federal reserve notes are worth nothing basically a a wheelbarrow full of federal reserve notes to buy a loaf of bread like in the Mm -hmm. weimar republic what what do we do what's the average guy gonna do just sit here and be in despair and hopelessness or (laughs) (laughs) no whatever you do don't do that um one thing, you know, financially, the the most important thing is to own some gold, silver, and platinum. Um, uh, silver first, um, and uh, I always recommend that people get what is referred to as junk silver dimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, these are dimes that were minted before 1965, and they are 90% silver, and they're just the ones that people carried in their pockets for many, many decades. Um, they were the the coins that I used when I was a kid. Um, <clears throat> you can buy those at coin shops, and you should first, you know, get yourself um, at least a thousand dollars, in my opinion, thousand dollars face value of these coins. If you can't buy that much, buy what you can. Those are are likely to retain their value or even gain a lot of value as we get into this situation. And each one of them is a small enough piece of identifiable silver that you'll be able to use it in day-to-day transactions if you need to, uh, as the paper money becomes worthless. Um, And then, you know, uh, you can go outward from there. You can get some gold and platinum, too. Um, the, uh, The gold eagles and the platinum eagles or the gold maple leaves. And, um, and platinum maple leaves are, are just fine. And those are just ways of hanging on to a financial asset that is not someone else's liability. Um, if you have a gold coin or a silver or platinum coin in your hand, 
you have something that's not somebody else's debt, it is valuable in itself. And no matter what happens to the rest of the world, that coin is still gold, silver, or platinum. Um, the fact that the, the person who minted it might go out of business doesn't really matter because this is a metal that uh, you know, any chemist can tell you is on the periodic table, and, and it's not going to change into something else just because the government changed. Right, it stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. from, from so financially, uh, first silver dimes, and then uh, other silver coins and gold and platinum coins. And then um, you should also immediately start looking to uh, your emergency preparedness, uh, as we saw in the two hurricanes, Katrina and was it Hurricane Sandy yes. recently? Yep. Yeah. Um, people who are well prepared for disaster situations come through them an awful lot more comfortably than people who are not prepared. So get prepared. Um, a, a good way to approach this, I think, is to ask yourself, suppose we had a hurricane that lasted six months. Um, what would I need to be comfortable in my home for a period of uh, six months of disaster? Um now, of course, the storm itself wouldn't last six months, but the aftermath certainly could. Yeah. So what would you need? How much food, how much water, uh, medical supplies, uh, you know, whatever you need to be secure. And, and what you buy depends on where you are. If you are in Manhattan, then you better have a lot. If you live in Powderville, Montana, then you probably don't need uh, as much or the same kinds of things as you do in Manhattan. Um, <clears throat> in Manhattan, you probably are going to need a lot of firearms, whereas uh, in Powderville, Montana, you probably won't. Or you probably already do have a lot of firearms if you live in Montana. Yeah, that's right, too. <laughs> <laughs> if you're in Fairbanks, you need a lot of wood or coal or something because it's 30 below outside right now. Why would you need firearms yeah. in Manhattan? Are there deer there? Is that, <laughs> is that why we need firearms no. in Manhattan? I think that's when the prey becomes the, the armed, the armed zombie prey. zombie apocalypse. We, even, we talked about last week, I, I had read an article on LewRockwell.com where this guy that lived in New Jersey in an upper-class upper neighborhood... And here comes a hurricane and everything, and all these people, you know, business suit types, are out there roaming around with baseball bats and sticks trying to survive. Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, these don't think that, uh, well, well, when you're hungry, they say in, you miss three meals, the person that misses three meals is willing to kill for the next one. Ooh, that's an interesting uh, rule of thumb there. Uh, I'll have to remember that. <laughs> well, I, I read that. I don't remember where I read that, but it was basically after a person misses three meals, they get desperate enough where they're ready to kill for the next for number four. Yeah. But we're coming up. Uh, we're at the break. Uh, we're at the bottom of the hour news. Okay. Uh, are you going to be able to hang on over the half hour break here, Mr. Bigger? Oh. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. Are we there? No, we're not there. We're all, oh, we're all amateurs here. No, we're just letting you know Apologize. we have one minute. Oh, we have one minute. Well, now we're down to four, 15 seconds. Okay. We can all just La da 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 da. How's the weather and where you're at today? Um, I'm uh, on the West Coast, and the weather is pretty nice, actually. Uh, there's been a storm, and things have uh, cleared off. and It's 33 better. below here. 33 below. Really? Wow. Well, that's good. That that, uh, that prevents riots. Yeah, it keeps people at home to listen to our radio program. Right. That's the best thing. <laughs> Got to go to bed. And it's dark. It's always dark. Yeah, it's still dark. Mm -hmm. We got 10 seconds. All right. We're sorry we're so lame here. <laughs> <laughs> we're just trying to get... Next time when you put your finger up on the one minute to All right. Okay. Ah, all right. Welcome back to Patriots Lament. I'm Matt Wont sitting in for Steve Floyd on the board. If you heard us giggling, it had absolutely, I swear, nothing to do with the story that was going on. That's one of those unfortunate things. They were laughing at me because I couldn't figure out which button to turn off the mics. But uh, it was a tragedy for Kansas City, and uh, I apologize to any Kansas City Chief fans who thought that that's what we were snickering at. So no. anyway, 
We're back to the uh, back to the air. Josh, turn it back over to you. All right. Um, we have uh, Mr. Richard Mayberry on with us today. Uh, second time he's he has been willing to come join us. Um, he's the editor of the Early Morning Early Warning Report uh, newsletter, which I'm a subscriber to, and I suggest everyone. It's real easy. Just get on Chaos Stand. C H A O S T A N chaosstand.com and sign up. He's also the author of the Uncle Eric series of books, which we have promoted and we volunteer to give them away. Just give us an email. We're not always good at actually coming through, but we try. <laughs> you give away the copies you have. Yeah, we give away the copies we have. So anyways, Mr. Mayberry, he's still with us. Uh, yes, I am. And incidentally, um, the website uh, also can be reached by richardmayberry.com. Great. That's right. Also, if uh, you go to patriotslament.blogspot.com, we have a link to Mr. Mayberry's website there also. Well, thank you. Oh, we, you, uh, your books have made a huge difference. Actually, even in this town, several people, we've given them away. My kids, uh, we homeschool my kids. They go through, we go through the books all together, the older ones. Um, we're going through uh, Penny Candy with them right now, and my 14 year old that's kind of a cool story i thought came he was reading through the book and he came to me he said dad i, I understand inflation i was like oh okay and he said and romney's a liar and i was like all right <laughs> fill me in <laughs> so anyways he just went through you know he had watched the debates where he was um at the time romney was saying you know he won't raise taxes he'll cut taxes blah 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 and all this and that and yet with his spending programs and with wars that it was obvious he was he's a a neocon warmonger mm -hmm. that he would have to spend money which means he would have to print more money which means we would basically be taxed through inflation mm -hmm. and that was my 14 year old so I really appreciate your books and they've helped a lot of people they're so I don't want to say they're easy they're easy to understand a 14 year old can understand it but a 33 year old can understand it too and get something out of it you're like wow that was amazing I've, uh, it's deep yeah, deep thought simplified. I feel like uh, I was telling a friend of mine after I read uh, Penny Candy, um, The Money Mystery, and The Clipper Ship Strategy, I said, it's almost like being Neo in The Matrix. All of a sudden, you see everything in a different way. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that uh, that comparison before. I, I used to do a lot of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of conferences where I'd, I'd be speaking to the to the public, and um, afterwards, people would want to come up and talk. And there were quite a few times where uh, someone would come up and introduce himself as a university economist, and he would say something like, you know, for the first time I understand economics. <laughs> awesome. No doubt about it. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. All right, where do you, you guys got any questions you want for him? I was just going to say, I... Uh... I know that from a personal standpoint, one thing that we've been talking about in our little text chain is, uh, you know, it's really easy to talk about all the uh, ether real stuff of, oh, you know, when the government falls and, you know, what's going to happen to large markets and stuff like that. When I think that most people who are listening to this show are literally just asking themselves, great, that's awesome. What do I do? Because, you know, they feel they feel very helpless as far as they they know something's going wrong. And at the same time, they they feel that there's nothing that they can do. And and I really I really do appreciate what what you just said, Mr. Bayberry, about you know doing something simple like saying, hey, just collect silver coins. It's really not that big of a deal. They're obviously not a dime anymore, even though that's what the face value says. But it is it gives somebody just a it's it's literally almost saying save. Just put a little bit of a savings aside. It's not complicated um, because when people need to start trading back and forth their little savings that they just put together is, uh, is, is a very good first start. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're raised in the government-controlled schools to believe that we don't really need to do very much for ourselves because if we get in trouble, the government will bail us out. <laughs> well, the government's to the point now where it can't even bail out itself. Um, and I think you saw both in Hurricane Katrina and in Hurricane Sandy what it means if you just sit back and wait for the government to come and rescue you. Um, so, uh, you know, you got to kind of grasp reality with both hands and admit to yourself that you're on your own um, and that if 
you know, you want to come through whatever's on the way uh, comfortably and p- possibly even with, with uh, some good profits from it, you got to understand what's happening. And uh, that's an awful lot of what the Uncle Eric books are about, is to try to, to um, fill in what the schools uh, have uh, whitewashed away in, in what the kids get, because none of us got it. If, if, uh, we, if you don't go out and get it yourself, um, then you're stuck with what they to- told you in school, and a lot of it is missing, and some of it is just plain wrong. Yep. What do you think, um, something that kind of has bothered several people, bothered me in particular maybe, the uh, Department of Homeland Security purchasing one and a half billion rounds of ammo. Sounds like a bailout to me. Is that the, uh, are they, why, I mean, we see Social Security buying 700,000 rounds. You see um, Noah is armed now. What is this, uh, are they getting ready to... Well, they're going to keep continuity of government, I guess, is maybe what they're thinking? Or Well, somebody probably is thinking about that. Um, <clears throat> you, you don't know if there's something significant to these purchases of ammunition or not. It could be that it's just another case of somebody who makes ammunition, let's say, or makes anything, um, who has political connections and has talked a bunch of congressmen into buying a bunch of ammunition. Hmm. Uh, that's what, the way an awful lot of the U.S. armed forces are uh, equipped. It's just somebody with political connections and makes something, um, talks his local congressman into making sure that those things are purchased. Uh, so, you know, it has nothing to do with... That's a good point. All right, I should bring that up. The, the armed forces training and equipment and weapons have nothing to do with the wars that they actually will have to fight. That stuff is all purchased according to political pressures, and then they just have to make do with whatever they are given. But there's, there's, you know, the the military does make recommendations. You know, uh, we'd sure like to have a lot more F-16s, and we don't really need any more F-15s. Uh, but what actually gets purchased is up to Congress. And so it could be this ammunition has been purchased for use on American citizens, but it may also just be some ammunition maker has really good political connections. I hadn't thought about that, but that's really interesting. Absolutely right. It's just another form of bailout. You just buy the goods instead of giving them cash. Yes, that's that's true. Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah, you never know. Um, uh, yeah, one of the things that, that I, I find very useful a technique I use for understanding things is to uh, approach politics the same way a police detective approaches a crime. The first thing you ask is who stands to benefit from what happened, um, and then you go, go on down to the rest of the you know looking for evidence and all of that. Um, but you know what actually goes on in Washington has absolutely nothing to do with the descriptions that you are given in your civics books or your so your uh, social sciences books in, in school. Um, it, that's kind of, uh, I don't know, those are fairy tales, <laughs> what's in the school books. And anybody who's been in, in uh, government for very long will tell you that. It, there's, um, there's very little that goes on in Washington that actually adheres to the system that is described in the school books. Mostly it's bribery and domination and... and uh, those sorts of things that really motivate the decisions that are made. Uh, and it has nothing to do with problem solving It's e- either. It's, a, it's about who's going to be on top, who's going to be running things, who's going to get the prestige and the glory. Those are the driving forces of politics. And paying back the buddies that got you into office. Yep, right. Mm-hmm. Crony capitalism. Mm-hmm. We're actually the best. What do you see um, in Europe... I think um, whatever happens in Europe is going to affect us at least somewhat, and maybe a short term only, but what do you think about what's happening in Europe right now? We see Spain had their housing collapse here within the last couple of years. I read a deal the other day where their housing market is 50%
the value is 50 percent of what it was two years ago mm -hmm. you have uh Ireland and Portugal going down the tubes. Um, you got Greece. They're absolutely lost their minds. There is there. Are they going to pull out of that with? Well, I don't think there's going to be a European Union per se after the fact. But what do you see happening there, and how will that affect the American economy or dollar? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I've got a little bit of a cold here still. Um, the um, it already is affecting the U.S. economy in the sense that people are afraid of the euro. They're afraid of the European economy. They want to get some of their money to someplace safer. And believe it or not, the U.S. is safer than Europe. And so there's some uh, increased demand for U.S. government uh, uh, bonds by the Europeans who are trying to get their money out of European bonds. So... They are actually accidentally helping to prop up the U.S. government a little bit longer hmm. um, by these people fleeing from Europe, trying to, you know, that's called capital flight. Um, the capital flight in Europe is helping keep the U.S. government alive a little longer. Um, but to me, the really valuable thing about Europe is that they are on the same road that we are, and they're further along it. Uh, socialism got installed in the minds of the Europeans earlier than it did America. Um, and so the Europeans are more dedicated to socialism, and, and um, at least until recently, they really loved this idea of robbing Peter to subsidize Paul. And so they are collapsing earlier than the U.S. is. And so you can watch what's going on in Europe and get a pretty fair idea of what's going to be coming in the United States. Um, it's, it's like a forecast almost, because they've got essentially the same sorts of economic systems and problems, um, which is that when you're robbing Peter to subsidize Paul, uh, then everybody wants to be Paul and nobody wants to be Peter. And eventually Peter's broke. Yeah, right, right. And um, and the whole thing just collapses, and, and that's what's happening in Europe, is it's collapsing. Socialism does not work. So we should be looking for some fancy riots around here sometime soon? Well, I don't think around where you are, but... Probably uh, not. Yeah. yeah, in the United States. You saw in uh, 2011... Um, there were quite a few riots around the country, mm -hmm. and I think those are just the precursors of what's coming in the United States. Um, the, you know, most of the big cities are, are going to see riots because you have all these people who were promised that if such and such a politician, or if they voted for such and such a politician, that then that politician would give them some sort of handout, and the handouts are going to be cut off, um, and, and those people aren't going to like it. Um, they're going to be mad. So um, if you are somebody who um, Obama has tagged as the wealthy, or you look like you might be wealthy, then you are a target. Uh, and, again, um, have the ability to defend yourself. The uh, When you look at uh, Greece, those people there, even knowing the financial situation that they're in, knowing that their government is bankrupt, they're still rioting in the streets demanding that nothing change. Where's our free money? It's absolutely amazing to me. It's You guys are broke. You have no money. The only money you can get is if the rest of the European Union loans you some. You can never pay it back. And yet, even when, they did, when the government tries their austerity measures, everyone just freaked out, burnt the place to the ground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's exactly what will happen here. I, I think that it will have, especially in the, like you said, the bigger cities, because people think that they're owed that. It's promised to them. It's their birthright. Their, I want mine, and I want it now. When, when you were talking earlier about the... Um you know this delineate delineate eh, the line they draw between rich and poor <laughs> mm -hmm. um and right now it's at 250,000 you know I, I look at these large metropolitan areas like if i lived on the island of manhattan and made 250,000 dollars 
it's really not that much money. But mm-hmm. if I lived in, say, you know, Nebraska and made two hundred fifty thousand, I'm, I'm living pretty well. Mm-hmm. Do you see this as a um, precursor to the government saying, well, we tried it at two fifty, but it's not working, so now we're going to have to bump it down to two hundred, and then just keep ratcheting it down from there? Do you see that as the as somewhat of the the background of what could be happening? Yeah, probably. Although I I don't think they'll do it in a straightforward manner. You know, when do they ever do anything in a straightforward manner? Um, the they'll do it in a separate, surreptitious way, uh, which which is that they will just keep inflating the currency until uh, two hundred fifty thousand. You know, um, isn't going to buy you much more than a newspaper and a cup of coffee. Um, so the um, the number of people today who have two hundred fifty thousand per year coming in, um, you know, those people appear to be well off, but eventually, and probably not very long, just a few years, I would think, everybody's going to be earning at least 250000 because the dollar is going to be practically worthless. Well, the the other concern that I have with this is there there's different types of, of there, there's basically two ways to make 250000 a year. You either make it, and, and I'll lump them all into one group, say like enter, entertainment type, where you're an athlete or an actor or an actress or, or that type of thing, where you know you um, you're making very large, large paychecks, and then there's the other side where people are are investing or they're business owners, and the 250,000 is profits from from really getting out there and, and working hard. And my concern is everybody looks at when they're saying, oh, people that make that much money, that you know, for an actor or an athlete to pay more from their paycheck is a different deal than somebody who goes out and owns a business. And I, I think what people are losing sight of is the idea that if you take a large corporation or some mid-level guy that makes a million dollars a year from his business and raise taxes on him, they don't see that as inflationary because whether it's your electric bill or your tax bill, these people are going to offset that increase in costs. And so, do you think by raising taxes, it's going to be a direct reflection on consumer prices? Um, I I don't think it's it's that direct. Uh, they have, um, you know, the business is under pressure to raise its prices to cover the higher tax, but um, he's not going to get the increased amount of money unless somebody prints the money. Um, a, a way to test. What you're you're saying there is well, let's let's suppose that um, the government uh, decided to uh, take this businessman who's earning a million a year and um, decides to uh, to tax him to the ra- to the extent of ten million a year. Uh, well, obviously the government can't collect that money because that money doesn't exist. That guy's not earning it. But if the government prints it dumps it into the economy, then he's going to get more money and the government can then, you know, raise his taxes to that extent. So there's all this, always this limit of, well, how much money is there really? Um, and will a government print it in order to make more of it? Right, but um, I guess what I'm getting at is if I if I make a million dollars and and say I pay 20% and they want to raise it to 25, mm-hmm. all I have to do is offset my prices by that 5%. So if I'm AT&T... I can divide it among the 300 million customers that I have, and it's a very small price increase. But if I'm if I'm Spinard Builder Supply, I have a much smaller customer base, and so that's going to affect my customers much greater. But I can still offset that cost. Um, <clears throat> but only if your customers have the money, because um, if you raise your prices and they don't have enough money, uh, or they just don't like those prices, then they're not going to buy whatever it is you're selling. Uh, the only way that across the board all businesses or most businesses can raise their their prices is if the consumer has the money and it's the government that prints the stuff. Um, if uh, you know if it doesn't print enough, then they just can't can't buy what you're selling. Um, and that's well, I don't know where there's a whole lot more that go that's behind that. <laughs> you know, good. This is a good. Good point to say, you know, read my books. <laughs> it's explained in my books. Yeah, definitely. Um, but, uh, you know, um, 
if, if you haven't read the Uncle Eric books, um, the the economics that you were taught in school is going to leave you baffled uh, because it's supposed to. You're not supposed to understand these things. The experts in Washington are supposed to understand these things, and they will take care of it for you, and you don't have to worry. They know what they're doing. That's the message everybody gets in high school and college about economics. Um, but, you know, I'm here to tell you, you can't understand it. And when you do, you're not going to be a happy camper. <laughs> well, and they obviously don't. I mean, if they're the ones that understand, here we are sitting on a $17 trillion debt and a trillion dollar deficit every year with approximately $212 trillion in um, promises mm-hmm. between Medicaid, Social Security, and Medicare. That's That's so unsustainable. It's not even... Mil- I mean, military legacy costs. Yeah, and people don't even. I mean, those numbers are so outrageous. I don't. I think when people hear that, sometimes it just kind of goes over their head because it's like a trillion dollars. What? Mm-hmm. Now you're talking about seventeen, two hundred, blah. But they're real numbers, and someone's gonna pay the piper someday. I mean, yeah. these things haven't been promised. These this debt is real, and if you live in reality, someday. Someone's going to say, uh, your debt's due. Mm-hmm. you got to pay up. I mean, one of the things that, uh, you know, we're talking about a business making money and a uh, million dollars or whatever. If we also, if we take into consideration private debt right now, I mean, we there when you were saying how much money is actually out there, there's really not that much because if you take private debt, into consideration with our supposed wealth that we have. I mean, a guy might be living in a nice house, driving a nice car, making $100,000 a year, but he's got $400,000 in debt. Mm-hmm. I mean, it doesn't, that's got to take effect sometime, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Um, um, you know, the, when, we're, when we're working with, with amounts of money, um, things very quickly become uh, fantasies. Um, and what you know, because because the money is, is a very uncertain value, and um, what what really counts is the real stuff that people produce: the McDonald's hamburger, the house that the builder puts up, the automobile that somebody produces. Um, this stuff is real wealth, not paper wealth, and um, the. Um, the numbers we use for in talking about money is just a way of kind of keeping track of the real wealth. And it's the the way the government has disrupted and disorganized the production of the real wealth. That's the big problem. Hmm. I have I've written in my newsletter, Early Warning Report, that um, um, several times that I think there are whole cities in the wrong places, doing the wrong things because of the way the government has regulated and distorted the flows of money to lure businesses into things they shouldn't be doing. Delta Junction. Fairbanks. Fairbanks. <laughs> Delta Junction. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. What Do you recommend people getting out of personal debt? or Because I've talked to people that they're just like, well, I'm going to run it up and run my credit cards. When it all collapses, it's not going to matter anyways. I'll have all this free debt. You know, there's a, a very disquieting truth to what they say. Mm-hmm. That is the historic case where if a country's going into a runaway inflation, you want to be deeply in debt because your debts wind up being paid off with worthless money. Right. You get all that stuff for free, essentially. But it's risky because you don't know when it's actually going to happen, and you don't want to be carrying those debts for very long. Um, and so, you know... Um, I have to admit that I have a little bit of debt myself, and it, I regard it as a speculation. I expect that I will wind up paying off those debts with worthless money. And mm-hmm. I will essentially have gotten those goods and services for free. Um, but I only have a very tiny amount of my money in that because I know, um, you know, it, I, I think that this is all going to be over with in, let's say, five years or less. But I could be way wrong, and who knows, it might be 20 years. So I don't want to carry very much debt. I could be wrong. 
and um, and that's what you want to keep in mind is is you might be wrong. So whatever you decide to do, um, be very cautious about it. Hmm. Mathematically, though, I think you're pretty much right on the money. I mean, economically, and if you put simple math together, you can't. It can't be sustained. Europe's proven it. Mm-hmm. Europe right now is proving it to us. It's not sustainable. Yes, exactly. Yeah, uh, that's a good question is how far down the road is Europe ahead of us? Mm-hmm. And boy, I don't know. Um, it might only be just five years or so. That's it's kind of a comfortable guess to me, but that's all it is is a guess. Yeah, it could be. We could wake up tomorrow. Yeah, and find out that, uh, or Monday, wake up Monday, and all oh, the banks are only letting you have a hundred dollars cash. Mm-hmm. I know that that happened with Sandy. I think that the banks were only allowing fifty dollars a day or something like that for you to withdraw yeah, cash I'm money. Right. I think you're right. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. we saw um, not only that, then you had price controls from the government right off the bat, which obviously makes things worse mm-hmm. immediately. It's just so foolish. Every time the government gets involved in a disaster, they create a bigger disaster. <laughs> yep. And they're the ones that we're supposed to look to, supposedly, because they have all the answers, and repeatedly, they destroy us. Well, again, my great hope um, is the homeschooling movement. Yep. Um, that's the only place the kids are really going to have a, a good chance of getting the truth about how the world works. Um, as long as we let the children's minds be in the hands of government-controlled agencies, then I don't have a lot of hope. So the homeschooling movement is, you know, I, I'm really praying for that to to keep on growing. We, I had asked you the last time you were on, I know we're coming up to the end of the the show here, and you're only able to stay with us on the first hour, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, 30 seconds. Had you, oh, 30 seconds? Shoot, I was just going to ask you if you had considered any more about leaving the country. The last time you'd said that you didn't really see any other place that would be better, but... Yeah, I, I still feel that way. I, okay. I uh, hate to to uh, be uh, that pessimistic about the whole world, but essentially, <laughs> as bad as the U.S. is, it's probably better than any place else. So hunker down and get ready. That's my opinion. Will we have another presidential election, you think, or... Oh, well, yeah. Um, Unfortunately? But it'll, it'll amount to as little as this one did. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no joke. Just vote for the twin brothers. Well, Mr. Mayberry, thank you so much for being on the program again. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you for all the work that you do for liberty and our our uh, for the people here in this country. Um, take care of yourself, and hopefully we're going to try to get you to come to Fairbanks and give a seminar up here and get us all a little bit smarter. <laughs> Well, it's a possibility, I'll say that. Well, that'd be great. Come up in the summertime where you can enjoy the beautiful... It is beautiful here. Right yeah. now it sucks because it's cold, but in the summertime... It's dark. It's the nicest place in the world. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we'll give our best to your wife. I hope she's doing well, and uh, I think we're at the end of the show. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Hey, welcome back to it. Uh, Patriots Lament, Matt Watson here for Steve Floyd, who's on vacation. <coughs> I don't know where you're gonna vacate when it's 30 below, but I think he's in somewhere warm. Go Steve! I love Steve Floyd. I love the hassle. Steve, you think he's listening to the show? Steve loves no. me too. Oh yeah, he loves it. You guys have a symbiotic relationship. All right, Josh, what are we gonna do now? Are we going to the phones? What are yeah, we gonna do? Let's uh. Richard Mayberry couldn't stay with us in the second hour, but uh, that's why we didn't take any phone calls, because we wanted to give him as much time to blab as possible. So and we will try to answer in his voice, tone, and attitude as demeanor. best as possible. Yes. So. Probably not as good, but we'll we ready? try. Let's go. Hit the green button. There we go. Nope. Yes, we lost that one. On one. to the next one. Bang. All right, we're doing good. Yep. And one more. Hit one more. One more. Press again. Okay, now go back. Clear the lines and. Call, are you there? Yes, I am. here. Hey, listen, uh, I was. I didn't realize you weren't taking calls last hour. I would have loved to hear him. And now you guys comment on the situation in Iceland and what they've done and what they're doing. And that's my simple question. So, uh, 
I'll take it off the air. Thank you know, you. I was actually was going to ask him about that, and I didn't when I was talking about Europe. But uh, basically, Iceland has kind of hit the reset button. They decided to yep. Kick what did the, they do? They basically shut the government down, the people there. They had a peaceful revolution. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting thing. They basically, the people of Iceland said there's no more, no more of you, government, because they were basically spending into oblivion. They were bankrupt, so they have kicked them out and starting a new constitution, which is going to be interesting because people being people, it would be interesting if they just rewrite basically the same thing to give themselves more freebies yeah people uh, have a have a tough time you know staying neutral in those types of situations and and not leveraging especially when you start from scratch i mean it's uh you know when the cookies are baked it's hard to add more sugar to it but when you're mixing up the dough you add whatever you want yeah it'll be interesting to see what comes out on the other side of that for sure extra chocolate chips i don't think uh wow I don't think it's going to come out. Oh, I'm sure it'll be perfect. They yeah. figured out what all the problems were to begin with. They'll put in all the checks and balances. I'm sure they'll diversify and everything will be fine. Or they're screwing up, in my opinion, is that they're going to put institute a new government in the first place. Yeah, anarchy is best. That's right. <laughs> hey, math, <laughs> math toe on the line. That's right. That's amazing. Now, see, here's, here's my question. This brings up a good point because Natalie Howard and I get into this all the time. So, <clears throat> and, so she... We'll talk about, like, even no court systems or police forces or anything like that. And so uh, I, my question is... Government instituted. Government instituted, right. Oh, private, a private corporation. No, you force. can have... Well, you, you saw courts, um, magistrates, for hundreds of years without that weren't state, quote-unquote, instituted. Okay, but my question is, at some point, somebody has to have an additional authority. So, for example... You and I go to court. I sue you, right? Sure. And the court says, um, Matt, want you owe Josh Bennett five thousand dollars or whatever the you money. You probably do. Whatever the money. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, who has the authority to force me to pay? No one. Nobody. Okay. So then, what? I, see, no one has the authority to force you to pay. But in the situation where you had a society that's like that. You would want to pay if you were going to stay in that society because basically what you'd have is what they used to call outlawry. You would be an outlaw. If you didn't want to play by the rules, you get to go somewhere else. And no one's going to force you to go somewhere else, but also no one's going to do any business with you. So whatever business you have, people are going to be like, yeah, this guy's a jerk. He doesn't follow by the rules here, so we're just going to not do any business with him anymore. You're done. Yeah, I guess You'll my, last about this long. My big, My big concern isn't... It's it's very similar to my problems with with religion as they bring up all these examples of somebody touched someone else or somebody you know robbed the church or this or that and and the issues don't seem to be with the religion it's with the people running the religion and so my concern isn't so much with with government it's poorly run government there's I mean, no I, such thing as a good run government though I mean it's an oxymoron how can you have a well run government it doesn't work. The first thing government has to do is to steal from you before it can even function. It has to force you to give them that's the funds. Of, that's because it's poorly to ran. Run. No, I mean, we, they they're, they're going to steal from you even Washington if it's the best government in the world. Washington they're going to steal from you. Washington didn't come over here because he he didn't want any government. Washington was he already here. Different. Though. He didn't move he here. He was born in diff- Virginia. He wanted it. They wanted it. Different type yeah, at of the time, and, but if you look at when they got their new quote unquote government, wh- where they screwed up is when they made the Declaration of Independence and said that all men are created equal and have the right to life, liberty, and property, or the pursuit of happiness. That's where they should have stopped. Where they screwed up is they said, now we need to have a central government. And if you look at the people that were a part of the central government, they were people that were owed money to, they were merchants, they were financiers and bankers and lawyers. They basically made that thing to enrich themselves. It's absolutely correct. Because as soon as Hamilton got in there, 
What did he do? The first thing he did was monetize the government's debt. They bought the state's debt. They paid all the people that they supposedly were owed money from the war and to get again, people to love the federal government. Up the idea of government, not right? But it can't a... not be screwed up because people are a part of it. You want to have you first off. You say that people are imperfect, so let's put them in charge of government, and that's going to be perfect. No, no, no. No, it's going to be absolutely not perfect. Because the only way government can function is to use force and violence on you to make you do what it wants you to do. And it's no, a monopoly of force because it, basically, to, to go along with what Josh is saying, is they, in order for the government to enforce, they have to take the ability for you to use force to protect yourself. So right. then they become the force for you. Right, you, but that's what I was getting at earlier. I mean, do you have corporate-ran courts? Do you have... You don't have to I have mean, a corporate-ran court. Have, if you don't... If no one has... If no, some group at some point has the has a, a force authority, whether it's national defense, whether it's no, that's what that's why I said it earlier though. Defense, you you have a community, and the community says, "No, you're out of here." Right, and that works on very small scale. Right, I, you cannot have you a grow. nation state like this. And right. why should you want and one you like this? One. So what should we what do with Washington, the 300 million people? What does Washington D.C. have to do with us? What do the people in Maryland have to do that affect our lives? Nothing except for what they steal from us or what we steal back from them. And again, no, if if those were they should have their own little communities. We should have our community. And what do you do in situations of? National defense. National defense. What's, where does national defense come from? One of the biggest things you could do for national Who defense fights is, stop, wars? is stop aggressing against people. Does the government the fight people. the wars? No, but they orchestrate. Does the trade. government make the manufacture the weaponry? Do, or do you think that do you think that people in in this day and age, to the extent that the world has grown, who starts wars would would still would still just leave the fields and leave their work and leave their whatever. I mean, there at being... some point it became more efficient to have a group of men and women at, trained for that specific. No, it was never. Now it's grown too large. Efficient. Come on now. A trillion dollars a year, that's efficiency. No, right. But you see, you're taking the extreme position of the current situation as opposed to what it, what the original intent was. Jefferson now, felt was... like that the local militia was all the armament that they needed. And did he ever have to deal with Scud missiles? No, do I have to deal with Scud missiles? <laughs> well, they were no, because we have those are freaking six thousand miles away. I, but that's my point: is that we we now have these right another nation state. You're talking about who? Like I asked, who starts the wars? Nation states. We start. We. I don't start wars. The federal government starts wars. The well, you know what? You can't even say. I was going to say the Iraqi government, but they don't. We go and attack again, them anyways in Libya and again, Afghanistan. It's a misuse of. Government. But it will always be misused. It ha it cannot be function any other way. My car will always history. need gas and get flat tires. History it doesn't mean I stop driving. No, well, then why can't we do something different? <laughs> I mean, we want to be. This is what is it? That's uh. You spoke earlier that there were going to be these rules that if people didn't live by, we would just they'd be outlawed or or. Well, sure, it's a, two basic rules. If I wish you would read Richard Mayberry's book so we wouldn't even have to waste our time on this discussion. Do everything you say you were going to do, which is contract law, and don't aggress on anyone's person or property, which is basic civil law. That's so simple. Those two rules right there are the only two that you need. If you break that law, if you violate that law, then you go to an arbitrator and say, Matt Want violated my I don't want to go to an arbitrator. I don't then feel like it. You're gone. Matt, you, then you, no one will trade with you. No one will do business with you. No one will go to Mobile One. No one will buy anything from Matt One. And you can't go on the assembly to pass laws to get back at me because there's no assembly. <laughs> and that building's gone. We have a nice little, I don't know, park over there or something where people just come by. And it, it seems like a very, it seems like something that would work very, very well in a very small scale situation. Small scale is correct. Nation okay. states, though. But the issue of us having 300 million people and 7 Who billion us, on the planet though? that we have to interact with at some point. What people interact with each other on a day-to-day -day basis just fine. It's when nation states get together that they start having wars and disruptions. When this guy says, this is my geographical area. If you come try to take my milk cows, I'm going to start a war with you because I'm the only one that can milk these boys. 
I don't know. And that's an interesting question, too, because you you no, mentioned earlier. You're the state's milk cow. <laughs> you mentioned earlier the whole, well, what about scud missiles and stuff like that? It's like, well, okay, even though it's an old example, just go back to the revolution. You had a bunch of farmers stand up against the largest empire in the entire world. I mean, they, they for all intents and purposes, said, no more, we're not taking any more of this. And even though Britain at the time didn't have Scud missiles, they sh had the largest navy in the entire world. They could cut them off, and they did cut them off. But they, but these pe these independent people still put up a fight, and they still claim their independence. So, I mean, you can you can fast forward to now. Sure, you might have you know somebody launch a rocket, but the but the irony is is right now if China or Russia or any of your other would be Attackers or hijack a decide plane to fly it into two buildings. Well, the if they decide to happens. drop a bomb on Washington D.C. or Seattle or something like that, the entire nation of the United States goes up in an uproar. If people are in much smaller communities and stuff like that, yeah, sure, they might be able to take LA, LA out. But then all of a sudden, the entire group of people still living in the area that currently is the United States turn around and go, "Well, we weren't affected." So then they turn around and, I mean, they're they're going to do business with those people who just lost a bunch of stuff. And the thing that you just said with uh, the airlines running into the buildings, didn't don't we have a nation state that was supposedly taking care of us when that happened? Well, that would be the that well, would, the government. Well, it, it failed. Epic failure. Well, right, but you, but I I mean. As tragic as that was, I can't blame the government for those people hijacking those planes. That's that is that is the product of 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 determined criminals. But the protectionism that, that you're asking for from government didn't protect you for that I mean, situation. And, and the and and under your scenario, with where's your, our rebate? And under your scenario, with your two with the two rules that anyone needs to follow, um, those people are dead and. So, so under your situation, that would be the that would have been the end of it. And the proper thing to do is to go into Afghanistan and Iraq for the last 11 years. No, I don't agree with that either. Well, that's what happened. See, that's what I'm saying is we're both sitting here cherry picking the the the. Not that there's any well, what good would about you do? It. Okay, so those guys are dead and they killed some people, but what's your retribution? They're dead. So right. what did we what did we do? So we said, well, we gotta oh, I, kill I, somebody. Well, so I we go over a, there and we I just think, start killing people. I think it was a knee jerk reaction, and that and that um, you know we were all hell bent on getting somebody, getting someone, yeah, somebody with a towel. Matt, I think the biggest problem is that we want to be protected no matter what. We oh, want to I mean, feel I've like never, I've never defended the the George Bush. Uh, Thoughts and right. on, just, on how to subsidize Halliburton for the last 11 years. In, so. in general, though, we we want to be protected. That's why supposedly we have governments to protect us or whatever. But it doesn't necessarily protect us. Well, and in I, fact, it actually does yeah, ills against us. And you don't have any choice on whether you get that protection. You have no choice on what the amount you have to pay for that protection. You can't go anywhere else for any other protection. You're stuck with, we're going to give you the amount of protection we want to give you, and here's what you're going to pay for it. Now, if you and I could do that in our businesses, that would be super sick well, I and think sweet. If, I think if, if the – I think – first of all, I think that the the federal government is is more intrusive on individual states than – what it should be. Mm -hmm. I think if individual states, um, you know, I think that the the federal government should should focus simply on national defense, international relations, and 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 those types of broad-based, larger than us things. I think that if individual states had been left to decide or or better allocate their own resources, I think that. Uh, I'm not saying all of these problems would have been solved, but I, I think that we wouldn't have gotten ourselves into some of the problems that we are now. Yeah, I agree with that. But I anyway, mean, the, um, um, but I certainly don't. I certainly would never suggest. Don't suggest that we have no government and let 300 million people. I mean, I just. I just 300 million people. What? Um, uh, operate with those two rules that an arbitrator. The two just, rules that have ruled the world for the that, last 6,000 years that at works, least. And that works great, but at some point, somebody needs to somebody kill someone. Needs the ability someone to, needs to, to have the ability force. to kill somebody. As long as it's not misused. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take calls. <laughs>
Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Are you going to jump in on this? Yeah, I'm going to jump in. Two awesome. points. Um, the first one is, is I'll throw, you know, most people are, or your scenarios are, you, we volunteer to live here. And we voluntarily, you know, submit ourselves to the government. And the second thing is, is, you know, your analogy of your two rules and you and uh, Matt having a disagreement and a mediator decides, you know, Matt was wrong, you were right, Josh. And you assume that nobody will do business with them. Well, that's just a difference between you and him. It's not a difference between me and Matt. So I've got good service over there, so I'll continually use him and do my business with him. Well, that's fine. And so how did the mediation work out? Well, what what do you want to have happen? I don't know. I was just throwing that... Uh, you're, you know, cherry picking like you were saying. <laughs> well, it's, even if, um, so let's just say that you do keep going, doing yeah, well, business his, his with point Matt. Is, his point is, if I owe you five thousand dollars, right, and you're not going to pay me, and I and I decide I'm not going to pay you, what does he care? I don't owe him five thousand dollars. That's true. And you don't owe and, him. And who's going to tell him he can't do business with me because I owe you five thousand dollars? What What will happen when you owe him five thousand dollars? Well, then I just make sure I don't, I don't. Owe him five thousand bucks, because <laughs> right. I want to keep his business. <laughs> so basically, what you're saying is you're going to be a smart criminal and try and screw as I few can, people as possible. I can be selectively selectively screwing people. There you go. So basically, you will be the government. Oh jeez. <laughs> <laughs> now I don't I don't know. Um, you have a good point. Uh, it's Al, isn't it? Yeah. That's yeah, right. Al. Right. And, Similar uh, with a, a situation of attempted murder, I shoot at you and I miss. Should I go to jail? You would right now. Okay, Even but, thinking about but, it, you'll go to jail. In fact, you'll get killed. But but with your but but under your scenario, I haven't done. You anything shoot at me, wrong. I shoot back at you. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say he you're gonna get back. shot. It's called but self defense. I'm just saying. You create a war between two people. Is that really a war? Well, you might feel that Josh is a little more armed than I am, so I'm gonna go ask my neighbor to help me, who's a really good <laughs> friend of mine. And your neighbor's going to say, you're crazy. I'm not no, going to get myself he's killed. he's a really good friend of mine. He's like, oh, yeah, Al, let's go. Let's well, go take just, care uh, of that, that troublemaker. That, again, that, that diverts from the initial question and adds more to it. The, the question is, in an attempted murder situation under Josh's rules, does that in, should that individual be punished? I mean, they missed as long as they promise not to do it again. Well, the thing is, is, the thing is, is under those rules, I can guarantee you Josh is going to call his brother. That's Josh, <laughs> and that's a... That's, well, that was a scenario, though. You shot at me, and you you a, missed. Okay, You're going gener- down. Generically. You're going to go down. Generically. Well, it doesn't have to be generic, because, I mean, okay, let's let's say that you shot at me, because I'm I'm way more of a pacifist than, than, than Josh is. I'm still going to call Josh. Question. I'm still going to call somebody around me, and the, and the the risk has just gone up for you. I shoot at an 80-year-old blind, deaf woman who has no <laughs> friends and miss. Then yes. you attempted Have to I... murder someone, should anything happen to me because of it? Okay, in a really... She doesn't have any friends. I'm going to use who Al. Al, are you going to say that... I mean, I know you... I don't know you really well, but I know you fairly well. We've talked before. So you are um, pretty much have it together. Matt wants shoots at this blind old lady and misses her. Who has no friends? Are you going to say that logically you're not going to go well? You know he missed, so whatever. I'll just keep going over and blah blah blah. No, if Matt want is like this, eventually everyone is going to say this guy's a nut job. He's shooting at little old ladies. He can't even hit them. <laughs> He's screwing people over. Oh, he owes people money. Suddenly turned into the Glenn Beck show. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you're out of here. <laughs> Get up and leave. <laughs> no, I mean, there's obviously there's all kinds of different there are situations. Lot of sure, where there's a gray but area sure, that but you can't just. I mean, under your scenario, people stop doing business with me, but but beyond that, nothing else happens. So I go, I open a new business, or I I have my. Well, maybe I'll come over and take my five thousand dollars. I'm just saying. I mean, there's Here's, just a lot of there. They didn't just wake up one day and decide, let's have these rules. Something happened. To to um, prod them or or convince them that the world would be a better place with these rules. Why are you now, guys trying agree... to screw each other in the first place? <laughs> it's a, apparently that's uh, that's, uh, that's human nature. Human nature. 
So anyway, that's well, why we have government. Sorry, Al, we've pretty much ignored you this entire <laughs> phone call. He's having fun. No, that's good. Uh, but you know, again, back to you know, uh, if you don't want to be here or you're not in li- liking something, you know, everybody's voluntarily staying or participating in the government, or uh, yeah, just staying and participating. They believe that you know they can economically and 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 their lifestyle fits where they live. And they may have to, you know, live with the rules and regulations that the government has set it, you know, set up. I don't agree with them all and I, and it, you know, the federal government's just too huge. But you know, people aren't leaving by the droves going somewhere else. Right. Right, well, cuz like, where do you go? Yeah, yeah exactly. Like so me, that's your two rule thing doesn't work where you say well, you just pack your bags and leave. Well, like on my, you know, like on a local level, um on a local level you know, it's. I, I think it's kind of like property taxes. You know, I um, I understand you know the arguments against it or whatever, but you know, to me, the the problem with property taxes um, is that I bought my house, and this is this is what I have to pay for the services for that house because it's in the borough. But the but the borough holds the both ends of that equation. They determine what my house is worth, and they determine the mill rate on that as well. And what service they're going to give you. And what service they're going to give me. And so so it gets. So you're to making be a, my point. So it gets to be a situation where, even if you get yourself into something today, ten years from now, you know, um, they have. It's not a, it's not static. It's fluid, where they they determine ten years from now that my house is now worth more, or my mill rate is now higher, or you know, to me, whatever you sign on for, that's what. It's going to stay at least at. you'll know it's never going to be worth less. Oh, some days it drops. Some some years it drops. Yeah. But then they right. just raise your mill rate. Exactly. So they own both sides of the equation. Let's take the. Is Al still on there? Oh, let's take the hotline. That one right here. Yeah, take the hotline. There you go. Paul, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. All right. Oh, this Jeremiah. is Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Oh, no. Who invited this mad guy on? Jeez. <laughs> I have a somebody, I have a key to the building that broke in. Somebody give him a stack of books. He has a key to the building, kind of. Oh, so he. I get it. I win okay. by default. We're gonna mug him and copy it. I'm trying to work, you know, and you guys are like driving me nuts. So I figured I'd call in. Um, I wanted to comment on your guys' scenario that you guys are going around and around and around on and Al chimed in on. Basically, let's pretend that Matt doesn't have a choice, Al doesn't have a choice, Josh and Abe and whoever else is in there doesn't have a choice. The government just disappears. You know, some, you know, God grants us all this great event, government goes away. So now what we're left with is a completely free market. And if the market still requires the type of protection that Matt and Al are looking for in this scenario, $5,000 owed, et cetera, then the market will develop a mechanism to provide that type of protection. And so we get, we get into these situations where because we don't live in a free market, we don't, we can't understand how the free market would deal with certain situations. The government has taken a complete monopoly on arbitration. And so the market doesn't have the ability to provide arbitration now. I mean, it does, I mean, it does to some extent and more and more. We see private arbitration and corporate stuff, especially international, whatever. But basically what I, what I'm getting at is that just because the market doesn't provide a solution now doesn't mean that given a free market, it wouldn't provide a solution. And I've got a example of a possible solution. Uh, Of course, this is just anybody's guess, but basically, um, I'm a contractor. Josh is a contractor. Matt's a businessman. So if I want to deal with a customer or if I want to deal with a large contractor as a subcontractor, they're going to require me to have insurance. They require me to have bonding. They require me to have all of these protection in place for them because, you know, I might screw them out of $5,000. And I think that in a free market situation, what would develop is people more and more would require contractually to deal with people on larger scales. I mean, not going and buying a loaf of bread, whatever, but but you would require someone that you had a $5,000 deal with to insure themselves and or bond and or bond for that whatever the 
transaction was. So basically what would happen is Matt screws me out of five grand and I take him to arbitrate. I take him to arbitration and the arbitrator says, pay him five grand. Matt says, no. Well, his insurance company, which I required him to have to deal with them, would be obligated to pay, not because I can go after them with guns and lock them all in jail, but they would be um, pushed names to pay line. by the free market, basically, because they wouldn't want to lose their reputation within the market because then they would lose customers. People would go to other insurance companies. And so the free market could develop systems to you know, provide these types of protections without us ceding all of that to the government. You know, it's in all this, in this in this free market protection, private protection system. If I'm a 62 year old homeless man and someone shoots me, who do I call? You're picking out red herrings there, Matt. Where are you? I'm just, no, no, I'm I just can't saying that's that how question. this all that's can, all this all developed. That. And private and, and private police forces, they've they've never historically been corrupt. Hey Matt, uh, Matt, where is the home, where is the homeless person located when he gets shot? Where was he at? Um, wa walking through a arbitrary field. Someone thought he was a moose. Who? Okay, who owns the field? No, uh, it's uh, it's some utopia where no one literally owns it. Oh, no that's one. not utopia. That's communism. That's not utopia. <laughs> that's communism. That's purgatory or hell. Or I'm something. just I'm just trying to narrow this down as well. He's floating right. down it's things, the, open All of this river is arbitrary, and, and, and just, all of it's. Uh, I'm just trying scenarios to point and blah blah blah, but all of these things have been done and tried, and there were problems with that. Matt, there's problems with life. It's called being born in a fallen world. But the fact of the matter is, your your answer to the problem, your solution, is what we have, and it sucks. It's it a, has I, where we, we have need, more people in prison need, than the rest of the world combined. Ninety percent of them are not even violent criminals, they're state offenders, 90% of them, where we have people that get their homes taken away from them if they don't pay their property tax on time, or if they don't have the money to pay their income tax, 90 days later they get a bill that's double or the finest half of what their bill was, they can't pay that, so now their fines go up more and more and more, they lose their home, they get thrown on the street, or they get shot. Okay, that's your scenario. No, that, though, I don't agree with any of those. But things that's that you your government. Said. I'm and and again, I'm I'm not defending any of those things. That well, what you we're trying to do is just say, is there something better? And this is all just discussion. Is there something better? How could it look? How would it look? But for one thing for sure, if Richard Mayberry is right, we're going to find out here in the next few years. So, I'm saying if the government collapsed right now, I would not feel the need to go shoot Matt Want. I wouldn't go looking for Jeremiah or a homeless guy and try to kill him. Okay, this scenario is that everyone's out to screw someone, and there are people out there like that, but I think they'd be taken care of eventually in some matter, way, whatever, but it's without having this government that decides who is and who is not the bad guys, and you get to go sit in jail to think about it. It's really easy to pick out all the red herrings of, you know, the homeless guy in the random abandoned field that oh, nobody owns or the old lady <laughs> that, you know, gets shot but, you know, that nobody likes her. It's really easy to come up with the scenarios, but the crazy thing is is we're talking about a very 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 small percentage and the the frank answer is you can't solve every single problem and it's not even necessary for us to solve every single problem because currently the situation that we have doesn't solve the problems but it still screws us. And so we have a government that's supposed to give us all 100% justice and none of us are getting justice and yet we and yet so many people still advocate for the fact that oh but it's still the best form of government we have it's like you don't understand you're right the scenario that josh keeps putting forward is there it does not solve every single possible problem that could ever come up however it solves so many more problems than the current form of government has that why is it that that people are always running back to say oh we have to cling to the current form of government oh well what about nukes or what about all these you know what about all these problems it's like you know what a lot of these problems we don't understand what the entire scenario looks like and if you sit down nukes would be cheaper and i'd have a couple <laughs> If you if you sit down, um, 
and you and you look at the total picture and instead of just you know well what about this little specific scenario that's you know may happen it's kind of like saying well what about the it's like dealing with abortion and saying well what about the rape victim that you know blah 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 who you know how does that deal with abortion well it's such a small case that on a case by case basis it's actually an issue that goes to the individuals at that point but if you back up and look at the whole aka voluntary society governmentless society however you want to call it as a whole everyone has the ability to you know freely look and satisfy the needs that they have in the market in a, in a completely voluntary manner. Or you can go on patriotslament.blogspot.com and well, I, look I, up the previous show that we had with Bob Murphy, I'm who answered many I'm, of these scenarios. I'm, many cer- questions. I'm certainly not advocating for that, or suggesting that we don't need or shouldn't have substantial government fiscal and, and regulatory reform. But even under your situation, where there are only two rules... Somewhere, those, someone should there's, be... There someone, is only two rules. I understand that, but somewhere... No, I mean, even right now, I those are the only okay, two rules. But somewhere, even in your in in your uh, very short two-line, two-rule um, uh, constitution, um, somewhere there needs to be an enforcement mechanism. And so much easier hey, Matt, than 10 I don't, million I don't laws. Understa- I don't <laughs> understand why Matt can't see that a free market can provide that. You don't have to feed... <clears throat> A monopoly of violence and arbitration over to a government which does evil to all of us on a daily basis to achieve private law or protection like the, that's easily solved by the free market and Matt being a capitalist well being it a might not be man, easy but should eventually know, would. should know that you know the market solves problems better than the government would ever solve them um, so I'm, I'm not sure what the hang-up is on that for Matt, because it makes good radio. The, the private, the private, the private market solves profitable problems for the free Protection market. Protection would be very profitable. Yeah, there's many. It's and, very profitable for the so, government right now. So, so in a subscription-based service for say the for the fire service, historically it's never happened that the to drive up um, subscription rates that these people providing this protection would go out and light houses. On sure, if there's fire. a monopoly for it. But then, it, but then, as soon as you have competition in the market, it used people happen. still will light fires. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and yeah, you're talking about a monopoly. You're talking about a monopoly. So, so if somebody, so if somebody, you're talking so, about a monopoly. So if somebody though. in the in the pri- so it, it, under a free market system, so if a crime is committed against an individual who does cannot afford um, this private protection, you don't know how cheap no, it would be. No, yeah. No you, crime. No crime has been committed. You're also making an assumption about the market. The guy who's so poor that he can't afford this. First of all, in a free market situation where 50% of people's incomes is not being robbed from them, who's poor? Sure, there's people who have less money than some others, and some people are very wealthy. But what is poor at that point? So, I mean, sure, if you want to make that scenario, yes, there's going to be the guy who maybe didn't buy insurance. But most people are not going to deal with him on the first place because, A, they're not protected. He's a liability. And then I would I, institute I, universal insurance anyway. I, so. I, don't want to change, I don't want to change the subject too much, but oh, before yes, I you get do. off the phone and go to work, I want to comment on Al. Get back call. from work. No offense to Al, but he, he called in, and I've heard him call in and make this point a few times, and others do too. Say, well, we all, we all live here and choose to live here, and we're voluntarily, you know, Submitting ourselves to the government by choosing to live here, and I don't think he's saying that in a positive light. Well, I didn't he's basically that saying love it or leave it, you know. And I, I, you hear that a lot. Well, if you don't like the USA and my flag and my eagle and country music, you can just leave. And the, I have a pretty serious problem with that because you're making the, you know, you're basically making the assumption that that government has a right to be here more than I do even though God put me here in Fairbanks, you know, plopped me out, and he, you know, he's the one who decided where I would be. The government, which doesn't exist, it's a bunch of clowns in costumes that are doing violence to all of us, they don't have more of a right to be here than I do, so why don't they leave? And uh, I'll go, because i gotta, I got to do some drywall. Please do. And... Get to work. <laughs> you're, you're, you're Who's you're the final arbitrator dry, between dry. governments right now? If you have to have a final authority, who's the final authority with government? Um, 
Ooh. Yeah, see, that's the... So basically, I, we need a one-world government, again, then we'd have not, a again, final not, authority. Again, I, I've never suggested we don't need substantial government reform. I just don't I just don't know that this two-rule arbitrator... Okay, let's go back to... Total set, uh, private capital... Private no, let's market. take some phone calls. We got people just... We're being Want rude. To yell at me. Hopefully. No, nope, nope. they gave up. Hello, they, they gave, gave up. up. Hello? They're there. They're there. You there? This is Winston. Winston, how you doing, brother? Doing good, doing good. Good to hear from uh, you. Of uh, uh, the the lady that called in a while ago about Iceland, uh, uh, I read a lot. Uh, uh, terrible things do, but I do. Oh, you can tell. Uh, 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 there's a book called Nigel. It's N J A L. Uh, Nigel Saga, and it was written. Uh, 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 the book I read on it was uh, 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 a translation that was made in 1860 or so uh, by some Englishman. But it's uh, it's about 1200 Iceland, hmm. and for about 300 years there, uh, 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 the reason Iceland was settled was because the uh, king of Norway started charging property taxes, and so these people didn't want to pay property taxes, and they went to Iceland. And they set up a government, uh, not a government, uh, 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 but anyway, they, 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 they set up over there, and uh, 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 they basically had, they had some laws, uh, uh, they had a little bit of judges, but they didn't have a state government. Uh, and like I say, it lasted for better than 300 years. Uh, oh. <clears throat> And the they didn't just kill each other off. Um, they did some of that, but not a, uh, uh, not the whole. I mean, it's always more than uh, lived and died. Uh, uh, but anyway, it was uh, uh, not wasn't a real violent thing. Uh, they had outlaws. Uh, they would exile people. Uh, uh, they'd tell them that they had to leave for three or four years, you know, before they could come back. People had property rights. Uh, 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 like I say, this discussion y'all have been having, that's an interesting, uh, uh, that was a real-life scenario that you could uh, 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 look into and, and maybe get a little guideline on. And what what was the book again? It was N-J-A-L's Saga. And I, uh, uh, I uh, they also call it the Saga of Burton, uh, N-J-A-L. Uh, and I believe I, I'm not positive about this, but I believe the the fellow that did the translation uh, back in the 1860s was uh, was name was Elliot. I, I'm not positive about that, but uh, I believe it was. Okay. Uh, but uh, 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 like I say, they they, they uh, on the local level, uh, uh, the people that knew each other would gather together and they would have a pure democracy. They'd a sure hands vote. And uh, 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 they'd vote on uh, what was before. Uh, they called it a thing, T-H-A-N-G. And then uh, 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 before they left the thing, they would appoint a representative to go to the all thing. And uh, all the little, uh, little groups would gather together and... Uh, and they had judges and, and stuff like that. But the, the, the most beneficial thing about the whole sense of government there was that if you felt like your rights were being stepped on by anybody around you, you had the right to challenge them to mortal combat. That's uh, huge. The uh, video game? No, 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 no. It was a. Uh, it was actually a. Uh, uh, you tell somebody you're stepping on me. I. I it, Pull out your sword and let's fight it out. One of us is going to die. Uh, it kept politicians honest. <laughs> Use of force is still in the hands of the people. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, and oh. and then so they had a they had a pure democracy on the local level, and they had a representative republic on the national level, and uh, 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 they had judges that everybody agreed to. So it just, uh, uh, you know, like I say, they, they, they's more to the world than what we can uh, sometimes fathom. 
Yep. Well, it sounds like you got another book I need to find and read. <laughs> Appreciate Thanks a lot, that, of Winston. Master. Well, one of, the, one of the inherent problems with democracy is the idea that there's a, very, there's a very fine line between democracy and mob rule, and that line ends up being pretty much education. So if you have a thousand people voting on something, as long as they're educated on it, then it, it, it should probably turn out okay. But if, they're, but if they're not educated, then it turns out to whatever the majority of them want. Well, it's the majority no matter what. I mean, basically, if it's not necessarily having the education of it. It's uh, what do you get out of it? Well, sure, because if you have if you have an uneducated group of people and you say, okay, we're going to give free stuff to everyone below this bar, the uneducated people are going to go, yeah. I'm below the bar. Hand but, it over. No, not, but, but the... But the educated people will say, well, even if I'm below the bar, this will have future repercussions, so, and they may not vote. Not it. necessarily, because that, not historically. I mean, we look back 200 years or so ago, and it's been shown they knew then that people are going to vote for a free lunch. Once they figure out the public treasury is theirs to rob, they're going to rob it. Well, they education is not. come up with a reason as to why they are more deserving of of something. Than right. So, Matt, what you're saying is that if you're educated, then you're less likely to be selfish? I'm saying that if you're educated, you're more likely to make rational decisions on on voting than you are if you're uneducated. That is individual. true in an individual <laughs> case, but it's never true in a mob case. Once you get a bunch of people together... It doesn't matter how smart or stupid they are. Then it's been shown that uh, the smartness goes weep, out the door and it's just like, yes, mob rule, get what we want now. Let's take another call, please. Call, are you there? Hello? Hi. Hi. So I think it all boils down to the uh, age-old debate of... Uh, whether man is inherently evil or not. and uh, But the difference is that uh, government just creates the delusion of being able to identify and control those who are inherently evil. Uh, my problem with that is that uh, I think that people who are evil in their ways are naturally drawn towards positions of power, which is why in the government uh, they seem to get off by getting on other people and act on their own entitlement self-declared entitlement to enforce their will on good-hearted, well-intentioned, and self-sufficient people such as myself. Excellent point. So, call, then, so caller, ahead. if I understand you right, basically what you're saying is if man is evil, why would we make a government of men? Yeah, exactly. Well, and it's it's a, a fact. It's the degenerates like Matt Wand to try to get on assemblies. <laughs> I Thanks. mean, they're the ones that always want power. You know, and for the most part, there, there's certain people. Like <laughs> there's certain. There are good people that try to go into government, and but we see, for the most part, it's the people that willingly want power and want to wield it that go into government. They're the ones that succeed. I mean, you can't really succeed unless you're a dirtbag. AKA, look at how did Obama get there? He's not there because he's a nice, good guy looking out for the, you know. He's there because he's a greedy, power-hungry dude. I mean, look at him. He was Mr. Anti-War and was shouting down George Bush over and over and over about the wars and going to shut down Guantanamo and blah, blah, blah. But then he got the power and he said, hmm, I don't want to let go of this. This is awesome. I'm going to start more wars. Right, which is that uh, that leads me to the, my second point, which is that uh, the laws of physics tells us that an object or body of government or student of socialism or freeloader or whatever will naturally follow the path of least resistance and continue on in that same path unless acted on by some external force. So the uneducated will continue to uh, on towards total dependency, and the power seekers will continue to total domination following if we follow this law, So unless they're forced to change. So those are my two cents. Thanks for the call. Man, man I haven't heard this caller call in before, but I really wish she'd call in more often. <laughs> yeah, I didn't recognize it. I think the other scenario, though, is... There's a difference between good people who make bad decisions and bad people who do what they can. And and I think a lot of times people start out good when they get into office. Right. But then they, like she said, the external forces. They get there, they're, you know, rose-colored glasses, they're going to make a difference, and then they just start hitting wall after wall after wall. Or and Power get, corrupts. Well, and you get into a situation where I think a lot of these people truly believe, even though maybe wrongfully so, but truly believe they're doing what's in the best interest of the of the public. 
And um, because there are no term limits on several high-level federal positions, um, we will stick with an incumbent because of their power instead of their effectiveness. Um, I just told Josh the other day, I'm sure you could find dozens of people who could tell you exactly how much money Ted Stevens funneled to the state of Alaska over his tenure, but probably stumble when asked three pieces of legislation that he authored or supported in his entire senatorial career. <laughs> so, And the same thing with Don Young. Um, a lot of people have a lot of problems with Don Young, and I'm not going to comment one way or another, but... The bottom line is, because of the power of his incumbency, he will never lose. Yep. Caller? <laughs> Hello. You on Hello. there? Yeah, I'm here. Go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, see, I attended the um, uh, Strategic Medal and the Rare Earths uh, little summit yesterday at the Princess Hotel. Hmm, I didn't know about that. Oh, that yeah. go? Anyway, why, oh, it, it was full. We had Treadwell there and uh, all the politicians and and all the mining world was there, or a great deal of it. Anyway, why, uh, one interesting thing from our beautiful USGS, and uh, I hope all these poor soldiers that are over in Afghanistan hear this, uh, and I thought I was hearing wrong, but uh, it was uh, still, it wasn't wrong. Can you uh, turn your radio down just a little bit? Yeah. Hang sorry. On. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, the... Uh, USGS got up there um, and spoke and uh, told what they were doing and oh and they they have this uh, real high dollar uh, like ground penetrating machine for looking for minerals over there they went over there and spent millions and billions probably and or you know or a couple thousand and uh, they found a big copper deposit and all well they got done and then what happens um, the communist red Chinese um, are mining it they turned it over to them. Or it was turned over by Karzai or whoever is uh, whoever runs this whole mess, you know. So these guys are dying over there, and uh, they're fighting. In the meantime, USGS is there finding minerals for Red China, and so now they're mining the big copper deposit. Wow. See, I mean, we got you know, and then they want to cut this and that here at home on on things, you know, on which they got to cut, but they don't cut the right things, like get rid of EPA people and you know all this uh, you know bureaucratic. Uh, jobs. Uh, no, they they no. tend to cut things that hurt the citizen right. directly. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. way, that way, the citizens will say, "Whoa, well, no, 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 don't, well, yeah. don't cut. You're, just keep spending." Local right. government does it all the time. First thing they cut is police and fire and yeah. teachers because yeah. it causes the most uproar for people to go down. And, no, I'll pay more. I'll pay more. Just yeah. cut so what it boils down to right now. What it boils down to right now, we're protecting the red Chinese mining there. Yes. You know what it boils down to. Yep. I bet you they're not getting shot at by anybody. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's yeah. Good. Thanks for the call. That's good. Sure. Yeah. Right. Okay. Call. Are you there? Yeah. This is Randy. Hey, Randy. Hi. How's it going, Randy? Oh, good. This is a very unimportant call, but I just wanted to share with you my feelings. I've been wincing a little bit listening to the today's show, and the reason is Me too. is because of the discord between the board operator and the sponsor of the show. And um, Matt, I don't know if you don't have to answer the question. None of my business what your financial considerations are, but I know Steve Floyd gets paid by the sponsors, and I don't know if Matt, if you're getting paid, or I don't know if maybe your payment, maybe you're doing it for free, and your payment is to be able to challenge. The host? Oh no, I don't. I, he's trying to reach into his pocket to pay me, but I will refuse. I, told you I would. I, but I was only kidding. I don't want any money. I really didn't want any money. I, my son's here to learn how to run the board. But oh. um, no, I, I came. I came specifically to stir the pot. I mean, Josh and I could sit here all day and go on about a hundred things that we agree on. But what fun is that? Two guys going, yeah, you're right. No, yeah, you're more right. Yeah, it's awesome to be right. But that's no fun. I mean, well, so so I got to get in here and kind of kick his little hornet's nest a little bit, get them all stirred up, get the people calling, and, and you know, I, I it, just, it just provides for a better show. I think way. it's fun. It okay, is well, as long as it's okay with Because we're going to drink after this. That's how Josh is. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> no, I, I, uh, we talked about it, Randy. I assumed that he, we would uh, be bickering back and forth, but it's, uh, we've actually, he was planning on coming just to be a sit-in guest, but then with Steve gone, I asked him, hey, I know that you know how to run the board. Would you be willing to come and do that? And he said, yeah, but I'm going to give you a hard time. Let's bring it on. 
That's right. It is fun. And, and to be honest, I, I actually kind of more side with Matt's point of view. Though oh, I, I think uh, Josh and Abe are making good. You, you and Abe are, is that Abe there? Yeah, Abe's yeah. here. They're making studio, good, yeah. good counterpoints and everything. But I've always felt that maybe Matt, you you should call in more. That way. They can cut you off. Um, you can be cut off, <laughs> thanks, and that's thanks. more fair. So, I'll take that as a comment. Because I, I, I really sympathize with the person. I sympathize with Josh because he's paying an enormous amount of money for this good service that he's doing on the radio, and I appreciate that. And and, and I just kind of wince a little bit when the board operators fight him. <laughs> well, I, it, while, you, while you're on, um, what did you did you were you able to listen with uh, Mr. Mayberry was on? Yes, and I heard you uh, tell um, Matt that he ought to read the books. From Mayberry, so we won't have to waste time discussing this. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I just was curious if you were able to listen. What did you think? Did you get anything out of it? Or Well, I, I kind of noted the very beginning of the call when you were asking about, you know, what would have happened if Romney and, and what's happening now. And he kind of continued on with the same thoughts he had several months ago that business, whether temporary or not, whether real or superficial or not, would have been better with Romney in there. And I, I think that that's the case. I think we're in. We're in trouble with this Obama in there. Yeah, I I don't disagree with that, except that I we don't know for sure what Romney would have done, but at the same time, it would have just prolonged. He, he promised to spend more money on the military. And he promised more money for Medicaid too, seven hundred billion more than Obama. So we'll just change the well, definition yeah, to was more a, more that was problems. A, that, but that was that was an accounting juggling thing. I right. mean, they were going to take it from one, you know, so they're moving it from one pop. But but. But he specifically said on his website he was going to re in, reinstitute the spending military spending cuts that Obama had made. Right, because we're so, only spending a trillion dollars a year right now, and that's we obviously spend, not enough. Only spend more money than all other nations combined, and um, <laughs> and so it's it's not a position of national defense; it's a position of national offense anymore. Yeah, and we just empire. Can't afford it. Well, I think businessmen and investors would have felt a lot more comfortable. A lot more at ease with Romney. No oh, doubt about it. Oh yeah, right. I, I agree with that too. I'm just saying that you know he he had he wanted to spend okay. more money. Thank you. Looks like Good we're out of time, you, Randy. Okay. Are we out of time? Yeah, we're just about out of time. All right. Um, uh, hit the website, uh, patriotslament.blogspot.com. You can email us at patriotslament at gmail.com. Appreciate Matt Want coming in with us today. Hopefully no, you he'll don't. come back next week <laughs> to torture me more and. Uh, We'll see you guys next week. I, I, I really do think it makes it more fun when we're... I enjoy you know, it. Instead of just saying... Oh, you know. anyway. I enjoy it a lot. All right. Thanks again. Uh, we're out. Steve Floyd has a good show, uh, good vacation. Merry Christmas to all. If I don't make it back, later. You're coming back.